you know, when Jennifer Hudson won all those awards for her role as Effie White in the movie Dream Girls, she ended her acceptance speech by saying she wanted to dedicate her award to a lady who never really got a fair chance. She said, this award is for Florence Ballard. You will never be forgotten. And I'm pretty sure if Florence Ballard was here today, she would have loved the movie and the Broadway play with uh, Jennifer Holliday. And you can't forget about the movie Sparkle, which is also based on the Supremes. That's how big their influence was on America. The beautiful Florence Ballard, the founding member of the legendary Motown girl group, the Supremes. Singer Marvin Gaye described her as a hell of a singer, probably the strongest of the three girls. Mary Wilson said Florence Ballard had the same type of singing voice as Etta James and Aretha Franklin. Otis Williams of The Temptations said that Flo's voice had a real duffer feeling and a strong churchy sound. When she opened her mouth to sing, you sat up in your chair and listened. Throughout the 60s, the Supremes broke all types of records. The only group that was hotter was the Beatles. Let's get right into it. I ain't gonna waste no time now. Florence Ballard was born June 30th, 1943 in Detroit, Michigan. She was the knife of 15 kids from her parents, Lur Lee Ballard, her mother, and Jesse Ballard, her father, who really was adopted by a family named Ballard when he was an infant after his grandma was shot. Now, growing up, Florence who nicknamed was Flo and also Blondie because of her light complexion and auburn hair was always singing ever since the age of five with her brothers and sisters and cousins at home and in the church and around that time her father had got a job at General Motors which was good money at the time but with all those kids still to feed it was still a struggle it was still poor and they moved from place to place until they finally settled in Brewster Projects. Brewster Projects. I remember, who remember the movie, uh, The Women of Brewster's Place? My mama, she loved that movie. She was always watching that movie. But anyway, now, when they moved to Brewster Projects, that's where she met Mary Wilson, who admired the way Flo sing. And... They became good friends because see growing up together they used to enter the same talent shows and Mary said Flo's voice was so soulful and powerful that she had to stand back from the microphone and and she could hit the high notes like an opera singer. Their teacher really wanted them to be opera singers. Now they became real good friends and they had made a promise to each other that if either one of them were ever asked to join a singing group or get a record contract, they would call the other and bring them along. Now, when they became teenagers, Florence and her sister Maxine ended up meeting a guy named Milton Jenkins, who had a singing group called the Primes, which consisted of Paul Williams and Eddie Kendricks, who later became part of the legendary group The Temptations. And Milton Jenkins was looking for some female singers for his group he called the Primettes because around that time girl groups was popular on the radio. After singing for him he loved Flo's voice and he asked did she know any other female singers and that's when she brought in her friends Mary Wilson and Betty McGlown. Now Diana Ross really was brought in by Paul Williams who discovered her singing with her friends on a porch. Even though they all lived in the same neighborhood, but at that time, they really didn't know Diana. They, they knew her, but they didn't hang out with her. Once they became a group, they would rehearse every day and they began performing at cabarets, dances, small venues, or wherever people would listen. 
They used to perform the Ray Charles song called Nighttime is the Right Time with the Ray Letts. Once they got with Milton Jenkins, he would get them a lot of gigs, but they got tired of singing for pennies. They wanted to make a record to put on the radio. They wanted to sign to Barry Gordy. His reputation was known in the city for putting people on because at that time, Motown was in the beginning stage. Barry Gordy had just started the label a year earlier and, and they was hot with artists like Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, Marvin Gaye, uh, he had just got there and Mary Wells and that's when Diana Ross asked Smokey Robinson to get them an audition at Motown because see Diana Ross and Smokey were neighbors and grew up together because Diana was good friends with Smokey Robinson's niece now they say Smokey and Diana messed around back in the day but in an interview Smokey denied it also heard uh, Diana and, K and Eddie Kendricks dated too. Anyway, now Smokey heard the girls and thought they had potential and took them to audition for Barry Gordy. And Barry Gordy, li he liked them, but he said it was too young at the time and he told them to finish school first. Now, another guy named Richard Morris, who was a songwriter and an engineer for Motown Records, was also there at that audition and he thought they was great and Richard Morris told Barry to give them a chance and he would look out for them but Barry Gordy just felt that they was just too young right then so Richard so Richard Morris took them under his wing to help craft their sound and getting them better gigs now once they got with Richard Morris he ended up getting them a deal with Lupine Records and they started doing a lot of background singing for artists like Wilson Pickett and some others. Finally, they got the chance to record their own songs and they released the singles Tears of Sorrow with Diana Ross singing lead and Pretty Baby with Mary Wilson singing lead. But Florence background singing still overshadowed their vocals on those songs. I told y'all Flo's voice was very powerful. Now, after that, one of the members, Betty McGlown, ended up getting engaged and decided to leave the group. And that's when they brought in Barbara Martin. But then something bad happened to Florence Ballard. One night, after going to a sock and hop at Detroit's Greystone Ballroom with her brother, she ended up having to walk home in the dark after she couldn't find her brother. While walking home, a friend from the neighborhood she knew named Reggie Harding, who at the time was a high school basketball star, asked her if she needed a ride home. After accepting his offer, he ended up raping her at knife point. After that, Florence was messed up behind that whole incident and was never the same. She stopped singing and didn't come outside for months. But after some time, Mary and Diana convinced her to come back and sing. And she did, but according to Mary Wilson, she was never the same though. That guy Reggie Harden that did that to her, he ended up being killed at the age of 30 years old for robbing people in his own neighborhood. He went to the NBA and everything. I think he was pulling guns on his NBA teammates and all that. Now, once she got back with the group, Flo and um and the girls every day right after school would go to Barry Gordy's studio called Hitsville, USA and hope to get a chance to get on a song. And they did end up doing some background singing and hand claps or whatever what was needed for Barry Gordy and his artists. And he paid them like $78 a week. And by that time, they all had jobs to make some side money like Flo. She would babysit on the side Mary Wilson had a job at the record store and Diana Ross, she asked Barry Gordy for a job and he made her his secretary working in his office with him. Now, with Diana working in the office with Barry, all of a sudden he finally started letting them record some songs, but he still didn't offer them a record contract yet. Mary, Diana and Barbara all graduated from high school. But Flo had dropped out, which her family wasn't happy about. 
But like I said, after that rape incident, she was just never the same. Now at a high school, Barry Gordy put them to work and they started releasing songs to try to generate a buzz. And, and they released a lot of singles that really didn't make any noise on the charts like Buttered Popcorn in which Flo sang lead vocals on. But Barry Gordy, he, he saw the potential in them and he finally offered them a deal. And in that deal, Motown controlled everything. It was, it was all in house from lawyers, the management, accountants, booking agents and everything. Put it this way, if they would have sold a million copies with that contract they had, each member would only receive about $5,000 if that. The crazy part is they were all minors, so their parents had to sign the contracts and all of their parents had doubts about Barry Gordy, but they wanted to make their girls happy. Now with a recording contract and Barry Gordy's attention, they was ready, but Barry Gordy told them that the primates name had to go because it sounded too old and too 1950s. Because in his mind, Motown represented the sound of young America. That's when Flo came with the name The Supremes, in which Diana didn't like at first because she felt it was too masculine and people would mistake them for a male vocal group. After the name change, they went to work and started working with Smokey Robinson and other producers and it would be the opening acts for groups like Gladys Knight and the Pips and a bunch of other artists. And on December 9th, 1962, they released their debut album titled Meet the Supremes. But right after that, Barbara Martin got engaged and became pregnant and left the group. But she really wanted to stay in the group, but Diana Ross thought it would be a bad image on the group. So they decided to just stay a trio now with just three members all of the singles they released from the album wasn't enough to make an impact on the charts and that's when people gave them the nickname the no hit supremes frustrated florence left the supremes and joined barry gordy's new girl group called the marvelettes who was on fire at the time the marvelettes gave motown records their first song to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100 Pop Singles chart. They had the song Please Mr. Postman. Man, I and you know what? I love the Marvelous, man. Especially that song uh, Beachwood 45789. I remember hearing that in the movie uh, Cooley High at the party. Anyway, now, when Flo joined the Marvelous, she replaced singer Wanda Young while she was on maternity leave for six months. When Flo got back with the Supremes, Barry Gordy started to take them real serious and decided to have them work more with the songwriter and production team known as Holland Doja Holland for their second album. And you already know the Funk Brothers, was, they was on deck. They had, they had the best production at that time. Now, one of the first songs they brought to them was Where Did I Love Go, which originally was written for the Marvelettes, but they didn't like it. And the Supremes, they didn't like it either, but they recorded it to please everybody. Actually, they was given orders to do it by Barry Gordy. And they say uh, Diana Ross was so mad about that song that she sung it in a way that she thought they wouldn't like it. But the way she did it was the way they wanted her to do it anyway. Another fact about that song is they really wanted Mary Wilson to sing it, but Barry Gordy insisted Diana Ross sing lead because she had that crossover white sound. Barry Gordy also put them on the Motortown tour with the rest of the uh, artists like Marvin Gaye, Mary Wells was there, um, Stevie Wonder, The Marvelous, no, The Miracles, The Contours, Martha and the Vandellas, The Temptations, Four Tops, and many more. He was doing everything to help them. He even pulled some strings to get them on the, um, the Dick Clark's Caravan of Stars tour, which was a big deal, even though their name weren't on the flies because nobody knew the Supremes at the time. Now, 
while traveling from state to state on a bus, you know, some of them artists on that bus will hook up. Flowing Otis Wims from The Temptations, they had a little thing, but it was nothing serious though. Now, every night they would perform and all of a sudden, the song Where Did I Love Go started to climb the charts and they would notice that the screams would get louder and louder every show they did. I mean, at the time, they was just happy that finally people recognized them and was dancing and knew their song. Next thing you know, Where Did I Love Go went number one on the Billboard Hot 100 Pop Singles Chart and number one on the Cashbox R&B Singles Chart. And now, they was the headliners of the show. It's like, that, that song took the world by storm. And to be honest, America needed it at that time because it was crazy. President Kennedy had just got killed and the uh, civil rights movement was strong with Martin Luther King Jr. And it was a lot of racial tension, especially in the South because they had segregated crowds when they would perform. When they blew up, only them, the Supremes, and the Temptations, who was hot at that time with the song My Girl, started bringing black and white fans together. After that, the hits kept rolling because after Where Did I Love Go took off, everything after that went straight to the top. They had five songs in a row reach number one. And that's when Barry Gordy made Diana Ross the lead singer of the group. They was dropping hits, man. I'm talking, Baby Love, Come See About Me, Stop in the Name of Love, and Back in Back in My Arms Again, all went to number one. And everybody wanted a piece of them. It was trying to book them. They performed at the uh, Copacabana, Coconut Grove, and the Ed Sullivan Show. Now international stars, they started traveling all across the world, and they broke down racial barriers. They were loved by black and white fans. And they just kept on dropping hits. They just kept dropping hits like, I hear a symphony, I love that song. You can't hurry love, I love that song. And you keep me hanging on, and many more. Now, as they were enjoying success, problems started to come between the girls as Barry Gordy began to cater more to Diana Ross. For one, they were romantically involved, which led to Diana always getting away. But the thing is, see, Flo was cool with Diana singing lead because they were all still splitting the money three ways. And she was cool with Barry and Diana dating because that way, if they ever needed something, she would just tell Diana. But, but Flo just felt that her and Mary could also sing lead too sometimes. Because like two years earlier, Barry Gordy had changed the Miracles to Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. He changed Martha and the Vandellas into Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. And now the Supremes will become Diana Ross and the Supremes. And that's when David Ruffin started having his problems with uh, the Temptations because he wanted his name in front like Diana Ross too. Plus, Diana, she wanted to do a solo album, but she just felt that Flo was trying to make her feel guilty for going solo. But the thing was, Flo just wasn't feeling the direction the group was going. She wasn't with that Hollywood fake stuff. She was a hood girl that spoke her mind. She just felt that Barry Gordy was trying to make them cater more to the white audience and she wasn't having that, which led to him and her bumping heads because he couldn't control her like a puppet. In Barry's mind, Diana's Ross voice just had that pop crossover appeal to the whites and that's the lane he was trying to go while Flo's voice was more for the black people very soulful and Flo wasn't just having none of that and she knew Diana wanted control of the group and Flo didn't like the new contracts he had them sign which was terrible Flo said she remembered they made over a hundred thousand dollars in ten days but it all went back to Motown and they were given an allowance of $225 a week. Barry Gordy and, and Diana started to do things to, uh, to her to make her mad. Like Flo had one song that she would sing solo 
every performance called People by Barbara Streisand, right? Now, one night she had asked Diana to sing it for her because she was sick. Next thing you know, Barry Gordy made Diana sing it every night instead of Flo. It was Diana's song now. And Mary Wilson, see Mary Wilson tried to convince Flo to stay patient because they knew Diana was leaving to go solo and they would find another member to replace her. But 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 Flo was over it, man. She was she was just too real for this business. Just being on the road 300 days out of the year, you know, always flying in which she was afraid of flying. Missing her family a lot. She was missing her family. And, and she was also depressed and never really got any counseling for that rape incident. And all of that just started to take a toll on her, which led to her drinking a lot. And that was another thing that Barry Gordy had a problem with, her drinking, which caused her to miss a lot of shows and interviews. And, and Barry used to call her fat and tell her she needed to lose weight because she couldn't fit in the outfits no more. Like one night, he was getting on her about her by her weight and she didn't like that so to get back at him when she got on stage she poked her stomach out plus she was drunk after that Barry Gordy had enough and sent her back home and another thing she didn't know was Barry and Diana had recruited Cindy Birdsong from Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells to replace her anyway in an interview Patti LaBelle said she was so angry that she didn't speak to Cindy Bird's song for years when she left. And she didn't speak to Diana Ross for over 38 years because Diana was the one that called Cindy Bird's song to be in the group. Patti LaBelle just felt that Diana should have just told her first. But now they're very good friends to this day. They cool now. But back at home and kicked out of the group, the media reported that she had taken a temporary leave of absence from the group due to exhaustion. But the truth was, her time with the Supremes was over. Right after that, she married her boyfriend Thomas Chapman, who later became her manager, and he used to be Barry Gordy's chauffeur for three years. And him and Flo had three daughters together. Now, Florence she did end up suing Motown for like $8.7 million over unpaid royalties, claiming that Barry Gordy and Diana Ross forced her out of the group, but she lost the lawsuit and only received like $160,000 in royalties and earnings from Motown. And as part of the settlement, she wasn't allowed to promote herself as a former Supreme or even mention having been associated with Motown records. The crazy part is, the lawyer that Flo hired ended up facing multiple embezzlement charges, and he stole her money. He stole her money, man. But she did land a record deal with ABC Records and released and released two singles. One was called um, "It Doesn't Matter How I Say It, It's What I Say That Matters," and "Love Ain't Love." But the singles failed to chart, and her album was shelved and she was dropped from the label. After that, things just started going bad for her, man. She was dealing with domestic violence from her husband, and they ended up breaking up, which led to her losing her house. And it had got so bad, she had to move in with her sister and get on welfare. And that's when she became depressed and began to drink heavy and ended up having a nervous breakdown. While living in Detroit, she had been robbed, kidnapped and taken advantage of by a lawyer and everything it was just bad for her man but but good news did come her way because in 1975 she received a settlement from the, her lawyers which helped her buy a house and a car and and things were starting to, to go good for her she was writing a book about her life she started to read the bible more and she was getting ready to sue Motown again she had got a, she had got back in contact with Diana Ross and they they talked and put their beef in the past and everything. She congratulated her on the movie uh, Lady Sings the Blues and everything. So, but on February twenty first, 
1976, Florence Ballard died at Mount Carmel Mercy Hospital from cardiac arrest caused by a coronary thrombosis, which is a blood clot in one of her coronary arteries. Now, the story goes a day earlier, Flo was at her mother's house eating a lot of ice because she said she felt hot. And before she went home, she told her mother, if anything happens to her, take care of her children. Now, after going home, her daughter woke up from her sleep after hearing a loud crashing noise. And when she went downstairs into the living room, that's where she found her mother, Florence, unconscious, lying on the floor, foaming at the mouth. She called her aunt, Flo's sister, Linda, and told her what happened. After getting in contact with Flo's husband, Tommy, his attitude was more like nonchalant and seemed to not really care. Hours later, she was pronounced dead at the hospital. The medical examiner tried to say that Flo had been drinking and taking two different medications, one to facilitate weight loss, the other to counteract high blood pressure, but with her autopsy showed that there were no drugs in her system except a small amount of Sonoquine, which was a medication that helped you sleep. Even though somebody told the doctor that Flo had been taking Tenuate, which is an appetite suppressant, and Lasix, which is a drug used to treat excessive fluid accumulation and swelling. But when he did the autopsy, he discovered no traces of these drugs in her system. And according to him, what killed Flo was a combination of heart disease, a blood clot, hypertension, and obesity. But she wasn't even that obese though. She's 5'7 and weighed 195 pounds. I don't know. At her funeral, Aretha Franklin's father ministered the service and a lot of stars showed up like Stevie Wonder, The Four Tops, plus thousands of fans, friends, and family. The crazy part is when Diana Ross showed up, the crowd booed her. And Barry Gordy didn't even show up, but he sent a floral arrangement that just said, Goodbye Flo. But check this out right now. After Diana Ross and Mary Wilson finished talking, the fans went crazy and started jumping on top of the hearse, taking Flo's flowers, trying to get something that belonged to her. That's crazy, man. After her death, her family said Flo told them that she had feared for her life after suing Barry Gordy. Florence once said that she had a lot of secrets on Barry Gordy. Her sister Maxine in an interview said she believes Florence did not die of natural causes and that she intends to have uh, Florence's body exhumed in order to prove her case. She also said that there was no trace of alcohol or barbiturates in her system, but there was this brown cereal type substance found in her stomach which was never identified. Maxine Ballard also said she privately confronted the man she suspects of being responsible for Flo's death. Maxine Ballard also wrote a book about her sister Florence Ballard called The True Story of Florence Blondie Ballard that y'all can purchase on Amazon. Yeah, a lot of people don't wrote books about Florence, man. Mary Wilson also put a book out called Dream Girl, My Life is a Supreme. And she did a follow-up book called uh, Supreme Faith. And she probably got a lot of information about Flo in there. Diana Ross got a few books out about her life that was pretty good reads. Um, and Barry Gordy's book was good too. But author uh, Peter Benjaminson wrote a great book about her life called The Lost Supreme. The Life of a Dream Girl, Florence Ballard. Y'all definitely should check out. And he recorded the last interview she did with about eight hours of audio some of the clips on YouTube and I'm gonna put them links in the, um, the description so y'all can download it for free and y'all can download some other audiobooks too and I also remember hearing about a biopic on her life 
which was supposed to be called Blondie, they was working on with Faith Evans back in 2010, but I heard Faith Evans turn the road down because of the producers or something like that. And then once Faith Evans left, they were supposed to get um, Jesse Smollett's sister, Journey Smollett, who y'all probably remember from uh, the movie Eve's Bayou to play Florence Ballard, but I don't know what's going on with that movie, so we'll see in the future. Another thing I remember seeing is uh, Florence Ballard's daughter doing an interview on the show Inside Edition talking about the struggles they had growing up without their mother and how Diana Ross set up a trust fund for them to receive $10,000 apiece, but when it was time to collect, the money was gone. I don't know, man. You know, Florence Ballard, you truly be missed. She'll truly be missed. A legend. She was only 32 years old. R.I.P. Florence Ballard. <laughs>